Hello and welcome to video two of the second module in our series on statistics. In this video, we're going to talk about frequency distributions. Now, we talked about frequency distributions in the previous video, but those frequency distributions were for ungrouped data. In this video, we're going to talk about frequency distributions for groups data. To illustrate the difference between the two, let's look at a real quick example. In the previous video, we looked at this frequency distribution. This is considered an ungrouped frequency distribution because if I look at each of the categories, those would be the numbers of hours, each category only lists one hour. So we know how many people read for zero hours, how many people read for three hours, for seven, for five. So if I have any individual number of hours, I can see how many people read for fun for that many hours. In a grouped frequency distribution, the categories are intervals. They're no longer individual values. So in this example, we have from 0 to 2 hours, 3 to 5 hours, 6 to 8 hours, and 9 to 11 hours. Now you might want to group your categories like this if you have a really wide range of categories. If I had from 0 to 30 hours a week, my frequency distribution, if it was ungrouped, would have 31 rows in it, and that's a little bit ridiculous. So in that case, I would want to have groups. So I might go from 0 to 4, 5 to 9, and so on. So that's an advantage of a grouped frequency distribution. If you have a wide range of data, you don't have to have as many categories as you have data values. However, one disadvantage is that you lose a little bit of this specificity. So for example, those 13 people in the first category from 0 to 2, I don't know if those 13 people are evenly distributed among the 0, the 1, and the 2, right? So I don't know if it was like five people who read for two hours, or if it's like 10 people read for two hours. I can't tell the difference in this grouping. So when you used a group frequency distribution, you gain a slight advantage and you also gain a slight disadvantage. In this video, like the previous one, we're gonna do two examples of group frequency distributions. First, we'll do an example of creating a grouped frequency distribution. And there are quite a few steps that we have to go through, so we'll work through those steps first. And then we'll do an example of reading from and interpreting a grouped frequency distribution. Okay, so there are six steps to forming a grouped frequency distribution. The first step is to determine how many categories or how many classes you want to have. So that these steps make a little bit more sense, let's look at the frequency distribution that we just saw. In this frequency distribution, we have one, two, three, four rows. So because there are four rows, there are four categories or four classes. Now this is actually a little bit smaller than you want. When you're determining the number of classes for a frequency distribution, you kind of want to shoot for between six to 12 categories. Six is a little bit on the lower end, but it's still okay. Generally from eight to 10 is good. The number of classes that you're going to use is really going to depend on how widespread your data are and just generally how the values are distributed. Sometimes you might need to determine how many classes you need to use on your own. Other times your teacher might tell you, make a frequency distribution with eight classes. And in that case, step one is already done for you. Step two is to identify a desired highest and lowest value. Now, these values could be actual values from your data set, or they could be nicer numbers that are a little bit lower or a little bit higher than the values that you have. So for example, if your data set ranges from 32 to 96, you might use 32 as your lowest and 96 as your highest, or you could use 30 as your lowest and 100 as your highest. So you can kind of round up and down a little bit to give yourself some nice rounder numbers. That's sort of an optional thing. As a bare minimum, you need to use the values in your data set. So the lowest value and the highest value. Our third step is to determine what's called the class width. And we've got this beautiful looking formula for that. We'll talk more about the class width once we start creating our frequency distribution. But basically, the class width is going to give us an indication about what our intervals are going to look like. So our categories in this example are from 0 to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 8, and 9 to 11. And the class width is going to help us figure out where that beginning and ending numbers come from. Step four is to list the lower limits. Now the lower limits of each class are those first values. So in this example, our lower limits are 0, 3, 6, and 9. 
When we go to create our frequency distribution, we're going to need to find one extra lower limit. And the reason we need to do that will become a little bit clearer when we do the example. Once you find the lower limit of each category, you're going to need to find the upper limits. And if the lower limits are the first number, the upper limits are the second numbers. So in this case, our upper limits are 2, 5, 8, and 11. Once you've determined your upper limits, now you can go ahead and count the frequency for each value, just like we did before. So you can go through and count how many items fall within each category, or you can use the tally system that we did in the previous video. In this example, we have the years in which each community college in the SUNY system was founded. So the SUNY system is the State University of New York system, and Mohawk Valley Community College is a SUNY school. We're going to construct a frequency distribution for these data, and we've been asked to use six classes. Since our frequency distribution is going to be about the years in which the schools were founded, I'm going to reflect my data with just the years. I don't need to know the names of the schools for my frequency distribution. Step one is to figure out how many classes I want to use. Now, we've been asked to construct a frequency distribution using six classes. So we were told how many classes to use. So step one is done. Step two is to determine your desired highest and lowest value. To figure this out, first, I'm going to need to identify what is the lowest value in my data set and what is the highest value in my data set. So I scan my data and I find that 1944 is the lowest value. And the highest value is 1969. Now, if you wanted to, you can use 1944 as your lowest value and 1969 as your highest value. There is one danger to using your highest value as your desired highest value, and that is you might have one extra class when you create your frequency distribution. Now, there's nothing wrong with using 1944 and 1969. However, I want to use slightly nicer numbers. I don't want to start on a 44. I want to start on a nice round number like 1940. Now, when you're picking your desired lowest number, you want a value that's going to be lower than the lowest value in your data set. So I can't use 1945 because then my intervals are not going to include the 1944. So I'm going to opt to use 1940 instead of 1944. Similarly, when you're picking a highest value for your data set, you want to pick something that's a little bit higher than your highest value. In this case, my highest value is 1969, so I'm going to use a nice value like 1970. Step three is to determine the class width. In order to find the class width, you're going to need your answers from steps one and two, so that's why I've got them on the screen here. The formula for class width is to take the highest number and subtract the lowest number, and then to divide by the number of classes. If your answer winds up being a decimal value, it's recommended that you round your answer up. So if I got something like 4.9, I would round that to five. But if I also got something like 4.2, I would round that up to five. So whatever decimal value, I'm just gonna round it up. Unfortunately, I tend to make some order of operations mistakes when I'm working very quickly. So to help prevent those kinds of mistakes, I'm gonna insert parentheses around the numerator here. If I don't put parentheses around the top, I'm going to be tempted to do the highest number minus the lowest number divided by my classes. And what my calculator is going to do is the division first and then the subtraction, because my calculator is going to follow the order of operations. If you find that you tend to make those kinds of errors, I strongly recommend that you include the parentheses in your formula to help remind you not to make that mistake or just to include them when you type it into your calculator. In this case, our highest value was 1970, our lowest value was 1940, and our number of classes was 6. So I just plug those values into their corresponding spots in the formula, and I'm going to remember to put parentheses around my numerator. And I got 5 even. So I don't have to worry about that rounding issue because I didn't get a decimal, but again, if I had gotten a decimal, I would round it up. So if I had gotten 5.27, I would round that up to a 6. In step four, we're actually going to start building our frequency distribution. So remember to create a frequency distribution, your first column is going to contain your categories and your second column is going to contain the frequencies. In this example, the data I collected represent the years in which schools were founded. So that's why my first column says year founded. 
Also in this example, we wanted six classes, so that's why I have six rows already built into my frequency distribution. So to find the lower limits, we're gonna start out by looking at our desired low number. In this case, we decided to go with 1940. If you opted to use the lowest actual value of 1944, your first value here would be a 1944. However, in this example, I'm using 1940. To get the next lower limit, I'm going to be using our class width of five. So all I have to do is take that first lower limit, add the class width to it, so I'm gonna add five, and that will give me my next lower limit of 1945. And that's all you have to do. So to get from one lower limit to the next one, all you have to do is add the class width, and then we'll get the next, 1950. So I add five again to get 1955, and then I'll have 1960, and then we get 1965. When I'm finding my lower limit, I wanna make sure I go one extra spot. So I'm gonna add five one more time to get 1970. The reason I'm doing this will become clear in the next step. Now, just as an observation, that extra value we went to is the same as the high value we picked. This is gonna happen if you don't have to round your class width. If you had to round your class width in the previous step, you might get a value that's a little bit different from the chosen high value. Now that we have our lower limits, we need to find the upper limits for step five. What we're looking for here is for each of our intervals, each category, to end just before the next one begins. So an easy way to do this is to just subtract one from the next lower limit. For example, in our first category, we start at 1940 and we wanna go all the way up to the next category, which begins at 1945. So I'm gonna subtract one away from 1945 so that my first category ends at 1944. And we'll just do this all the way down. So my next category, I want to start at 1945. To figure out where it ends, I subtract one from the next beginning. So subtract one from 1950, and I end up with 1949. And we'll just do that all the way down. So for the next one, I want it to end just before 1955. So it'll end at 1954. This next category goes from 1955 just until 1960. So it's gonna end at 1959 and then we'll have 1964. And now you can see why we have that extra value. In order to figure out where this last category ends, I'm going to subtract one from the 1970 to get 1969. Now, at this point, you wanna make sure that all of your categories encompass all of your data values. So in this case, the lowest value that we found was 1944, and that fits into our first category. The highest value that we had was 1969, and that fits in our last category. Because there's a little bit of wiggle room and because there's a little bit of rounding with our class width, it may be that your last category does not include your highest value. It could be that your highest value is beyond the categories that you found, or it could be that your highest value is below that last category. So this is an instance where you might need to tweak a little bit your number of classes. If you wanna keep six categories, then you might have to increase or decrease your class width accordingly. Or if you want to keep your class width, then you might need to add an extra category or take away one of the categories. So what's a little bit tricky about creating a grouped frequency distribution is that there's no one right way of doing it. The way that you make your grouped frequency distribution and the way that I make mine might be very slightly different. And that is okay. It's okay to be a little bit different. It just makes it tricky to talk about or tricky to check your work sometimes. Now, the last step to creating our grouped frequency distribution is basically what we did before for our other frequency distributions. We have to figure out how often each of these categories occurs. Now, I could use a tally system like we did before, but in this case, I went through and I just counted how many years fell within each interval. So for example, for that first category from 1940 to 1944, there was only one year that fell within that category. For 1945 to 1949, there were four years, and so on. So you can pause the video here if you want and fill in your frequencies, and then we can check your work when you've completed. All right, moving on, in the next category, we also had four years, and then from 55 to 59, we had four years. From 1960 to 1964, we had nine years, and from 1965 to 1969, we had eight. And remember, you can do sort of a quick check of your work by adding all of the frequencies together, and that should equal your sample size. And that's how you create a grouped frequency distribution.
Now, one thing I want to point out that's a little bit weird is that the upper limits are kind of cosmetic. We don't really use them for anything. They're there to remind us about where each category is going to end. But just for instance, suppose I had a value like 1944.5. Where would that go? Would that go in the category for 1940 to 1944, or would it go in the category for 1945 to 1949? So in those cases, when you have like a between value, it's important to remember that these classes actually represent starting at the first lower limit and going all the way up to, but not including, the next lower limit. What this means is that first category of 1940 to 1944 actually represents everything starting in 1940, going all the way up to, but not including, 1945. So a value like 1944.5 would be included in that first category. A value like 1954.2 would be included in the category 1950 to 1954. So would be a value like 1954.9. Okay, so anything that is in the interval from the lower limit, including it, all the way up to, but not including, the next lower limit. So when you're using a grouped frequency distribution, I encourage you to think of them as from lower limit to lower limit, not lower limit to upper limit. And we're going to see this in the next example when we go to interpret some frequency distribution information, as well as later on when we go to make a graph based off of this table. Now before we do another example, there are three notes that we want to look at. Note number one, in a grouped frequency distribution, all of your classes must have an upper and a lower limit. What this means is that I don't want a category that says something like six feet or taller, or seven dollars or less. In the previous example, all of our categories had a beginning year and an ending year, and the same must be true when you create a grouped frequency distribution. The reason for this is dependent on note number two, which states that all classes must be the same width. When we created our frequency distribution, we added the same value to each lower limit every time. We want all of our classes to have the same width so that all of our grouping is consistent. And lastly, note number three is that the number of classes that you use can significantly alter what's called the shape of the distribution. In video four, we're going to talk in more detail about what that means, the shape of a distribution, but just know that how many classes you use can influence the way that your data is going to look. With this in mind, let's do an example of interpreting a grouped frequency distribution. The frequency distribution to the right displays the ages of inmates incarcerated in the Oneida County Correctional Facility as of June 11, 2016. We're going to use this frequency distribution to answer the following questions. Question number one. Which age group has the smallest frequency? Notice in this question they're asking us for an age group based on the frequency. So the place I'm going to look first is to find the smallest frequency. Going down the frequency column, the smallest number there is the number 4. Now, it didn't ask us what is the smallest frequency, it asked us about an age group, so I'm going to report an answer of the age group. In this case, there were only 4 people between the ages of 66 and 70. So, the age group with the smallest frequency is 66 to 70 years old. Please note that since these categories represent ages, I do want to make sure that I label my answer with years old. The second question is, how many classes are there? Remember that classes represent categories. So this question is asking us how many different age groups are there? So I'm gonna count up the number of rows to figure out the number of classes. And it looks like there are 11. So we have 11 classes in this example. The third question is asking us, what is the class width? To help us find the class width here, we actually don't need to use that super complicated formula from before. Instead, I'm going to think about step four when we created our previous frequency distribution. In step four, to find the next lower limit, all we had to do was add the class width to the previous lower limit. So if I have two lower limits, I can get the class width just by subtracting them. For instance, in the previous example, if I did 1945 minus 1940, I would get the class width of five. So we're going to use the same principle here. I'm going to look at the first two lower limits. In this case, it was 16 and 21. 
So to get the class width, all I have to do is subtract the two, big minus small, so 21 minus 16, and that will give me five years. I could actually use any two consecutive lower limits for this task because the distance from any one lower limit to the next one is always the class width. We always added the same number. So for example, if I did from 46 to 51, I could subtract those and I would also get five years. And the last question is how many people were incarcerated in the Oneida County Correctional Facility on June 11, 2016? This question is asking us for a population size. In the previous video, we saw that we could find the sample size or the population size by adding together all of the frequencies. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to add together all the frequencies in this column. So it's probably easiest to use a calculator to do this. And when I use my calculator, I wound up with 494 people. So I recommend that you pause the video and check this on your own to make sure that I did my arithmetic correctly. Also notice that I have labeled my answer with people here. You could also have said 494 inmates. So we always want to be labeling our numbers so that we know what those values represent. And before we end this video, just one quick comment about the class width. There were two different ways that we found the class width, and the formula or the method that you're going to use depends on what it is you're trying to do. When we were creating a frequency distribution, we had to use our desired highest value, our desired lowest value, and the number of classes, and then round our answer up if we got a decimal. When we were reading from a frequency distribution, we used a much simpler method, and we just subtracted the first two lower limits. And that concludes our video about grouped frequency distributions. In the next video, we're going to talk about a variation on a frequency distribution that you can make for either a grouped or an ungrouped frequency distribution, and these are called relative frequency distributions. A relative frequency distribution is useful when you want to know things in terms of percents or ratios rather than in strict amounts. So if you're interested in watching that video, click the arrow on the right. Once again, thanks for watching and have a fabulous day.